It all began in the fall of 1996 when I slipped into a really bad clinical depression. Actually, the depression had begun about six months earlier uh, due to two events. First, uh, I went through a painful divorce, which is a very common trigger for depression for people. And secondly, uh, I was a professional author and Bantam Books, my publisher, let three of my books go out of print in one month. So very quickly I was faced with a loss of love and a lo loss of work and that is what Sigmund Freud defined as the epitome of mental health. So here I was limping along and at the advice of a friend I went to a psychiatrist and tried a new Prozac related drug that had just come on the market. Now I had tried these uh, types of drugs earlier because I've had depression off and on ever since I was 18 so this was nothing new to me. But I thought this would maybe help me cope a little better. But unfortunately, I had an allergic or paradoxical reaction to this drug. And instead of, me, instead of calming me down, it sent me into an agitated depression. I, uh, the first night I woke up at 3 in the morning, I was highly anxious. I couldn't go back to sleep. I woke up again at 6. I was pacing back and forth, back and forth. As the day wore on, I got worse and worse. And so I went down to the emergency room and entered into a psychiatric ward asking for help. Uh, they put me on some tranquilizers which were useful and a couple of days later I was discharged. For the first week I was feeling okay but slowly the anxiety started to creep up and even worse, a really bad depression hit me. A friend calls it a black tar depression. Now I want to describe a couple of characteristics of this depression. Uh, first was the intense pain. Now it's not like a physical pain where you can locate it in some part of the body. It wasn't burning or stabbing or shooting. It was like an all-encompassing malaise that it affected every fiber of my being. So this pain of depression, it's hard to talk about to someone who hasn't been through it. William Styron, the great author who wrote the book Darkness Visible, told his daughter, I would rather have my arm amputated without anesthesia than to go through the pain I'm going through right now. That's how bad it was. The second thing about the pain was that it was chronic, it was unremitting, it was always with me, nonstop, like having an emotional toothache. You know that throbbing of the tooth pound, 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 can't get rid of it. I'd go to a movie, it was there. I'd go take a walk in the woods, it was there. I'd you know, go out with a friend on a beautiful sunny day, it was always there. Uh, very uh, a few times, you know, except maybe when I was sleeping, did I get any relief. <clears throat> and then finally, the worst thing about this pain is I thought, I thought it would never end. I felt like this is the way I'm gonna have to live forever. That feeling of hopelessness that is so classic of depression. And I thought to myself, well, if this is, you know, how it's going to be, I might as well check out. Okay, so that was the pain of the depression. But even more than the depression, it was the anxiety that was the defining symptom of my episode. Um, as I said, I had this agitated depression. And these anxiety attacks would come upon me without warning. Usually first thing in the morning, I would get up and my foot would, you know, I would start shaking like this. My, my feet would go back and forth. My feet, you know, my... They'd be tapping and I'd, I'd kind of start rocking myself. I felt as if someone had snuck into my bedroom and, and injected me with five cups of espresso. I felt like my nervous system was just completely out of control. Then I would go swimming, it would calm down, I'd feel okay, and then it would come back on again. It was like an epileptic seizure. Sometimes the only thing I could do is literally hit my head against the wall or hit myself on the head to try to externalize the, the anxiety that I was feeling. And, you know, I would take uh, clonopin sometimes to try to calm me down. It would, but I'd be really loopy and feeling kind of drugged. And then it would wear off and it would come back all over again. So eventually I felt like my head was being batted back and forth like a ping pong uh, by two drunken ping pong players, one named anxiety and the other named depression. Now, I went back to the psychiatrist and said, yeah, I'm really in a bad state. You know, can we try some other drugs here? And they tried a whole bunch of them over the one year, uh, all sorts of types, the tricyclids, the SSRIs, what are called the MAO inhibitors, every class they can think of, and nothing worked. So at last I was diagnosed with treatment-resistant depression. And the other thing that happened is that, you know, well-meaning friends would say to me, well, look, you know, um, you've written these books on affirmations, positive thinking, why don't you try to just you know, affirm your way out of this depression. Why don't you just try to use positive thinking and use your force of will because you've got a strong will? Well, when the pain of depression, when the agitation of anxiety crosses a certain threshold, then you can't will yourself or think yourself out of it. That's like telling a cancer patient to snap out of a tumor. You know, when people say snap out of it, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you can't do that when the depression gets that bad. 
So here I was in this hopeless situation. I felt like I was in a tunnel with both exits sealed. Uh, on the door it read no exit and there's no way out. And I began to obsess that the way I was going to end up was I had two choices. One was I was going to spend the rest of my life in a mental hospital or two, I could end the pain now and get it over with and commit suicide. And as time went on, this little voice in my head, this obsessive voice, this rhyming voice started to come on and said, madness or suicide, it's yours to decide. Madness or suicide, it's yours to decide. I had to decide, I had two options, either go mad or kill myself. And at that point, I felt like, you know, I have to do myself in because I can't live like this the rest of my life. Well, here I am telling you my story. Obviously, I didn't kill myself, and so how did I get out of this dark night of the soul? Well, there were two turning points. The first was I met a woman uh, who, like myself, had been depressed, had been hospitalized, but was also a recovering alcoholic. She became my therapist. And one day she said, Doug, in AA we have something called the 24-hour plan. We don't promise never to drink again. We just say we won't do it for the next 24 hours. You don't have to tell me that you'll never commit suicide. Just say that for the next 24 hours, you'll stay safe. Even better yet, try to stay safe just for the rest of the day. Create some sort of a life raft for yourself that you can use. So working together, Pat and I put together what I called my daily survival plan for living in hell. This survival plan uh, eventually became the, the uh, recovery program I write about in my book, uh, Healing from Depression, 12 Weeks to a Better Mood. And it had five parts physical self-care, taking care of my physical body through exercise and nutrition and breathing and, and anything I could do to calm myself down, mental emotional self-care, watching my self-talk, giving myself the suggestion this too shall pass when I felt hopeless, uh, people support, social support, that was really critical because you can't get through a depressive episode like this on your own. You need to reach out for support, you can't isolate. And in fact, it was my caring about other people that was one of the things that prevented me from committing suicide because I was a survivor of suicide when a friend of mine did it years ago and I realized the wreckage it leaves in its wake and I didn't want to do that to other people. Then there was spiritual connection, uh, feeling uh, part of a greater, something greater than yourself, which I'll talk about in a minute. And finally, what I call lifestyle habits, which is basically giving structure and your routine to your life, trying to get into nature and other positive things you can do during the day that will help you feel better, even if it's only for a moment. Now, creating the survival plan was very good for me because it gave me some sense of empowerment. You know, I knew I couldn't stop my symptoms, I couldn't control the anxiety, I couldn't control the attacks, I couldn't really stop the dark thoughts, but if I could at least do a couple of things each day that attempted to help myself out, I felt like maybe I'm, you know, have some sort of power here and I can have some impact on my recovery. So that kind of kept me afloat. The next thing that happened was I went to back to a church, what's called a New Thought Church, uh, that I had been going to for quite some time, uh, called the Living Enrichment Center, in the hopes I would get some inspiration. That didn't really help, but I, there was a prayer ministry going on there, and there was a, a prayer box, and I started writing prayer requests every week. Help, this is Douglas. I'm in a suicidal depression. I can't get out. I'm losing hope. I may have to commit suicide. Please do something for me. And one day I got a call from the head of the prayer ministry named Eddie, and she said, Hey Douglas, we know you're around here, you know, you've done some workshops for us, we really care about you, and I have an idea. When one of our congregants, uh, Carol, had cancer, we brought into the, the center her whole support team, her doctor, her, her husband, her friends, uh, and we ministers and we all came together and tried to do as a group what none of us could do by ourselves. We used the power of the group energy and it really helped her out. We want to do the same experiment with you. Why don't you bring in your wife, your best friend, your social worker, you know, anybody else on your support team. We'll bring in you know, Mary, the minister, myself, some other members of the prayer ministry and see what we can do. So two weeks later on July 14th, 1997, I showed up at the office of Mary Morrissey and sure enough there were 12 people there who had taken time out of their day waiting to support me. And after introductions, people said how they knew me, uh, what I was going through, and even though I felt hopeless, each one of those people testified that they thought I was going to get better. As a matter of fact, they actually said they knew I was going to get better. And so they were able to believe for me what I could not believe for myself. 
So after that introduction was done, <clears throat> Mary said to me, she said, Douglas, I know you believe in the power of thought and affirmation because everything in the world is created twice, once in the world of thought and then in the world of form. Why don't you write out in a series of affirmations what I would call a vision statement. Describe what you would look and feel like if your symptoms of anxiety and depression were gone. You know, how would you feel in the morning? What would you be doing during the day? What type of thoughts would you be thinking? What type of people would you be with? Try to make it succinct and write a little maybe a paragraph or maybe two paragraphs about what that would be like. And I did that and then we made copies of it and we handed it out to the other 12 people and they promised me that every morning for the next 30 days at 9 in the morning they would sit down wherever they were, read that vision statement for 30 seconds and then think of me as whole and well. And I could count on that group mind working during that time. So I left the meeting. Um, I was encouraged by the support I was getting. I didn't really feel any better. In fact, the next day, Tuesday, I felt worse. But then something really special happened on Thursday, three days after the meeting. I woke up and the black cloud was a little more gray, less black. The agitation was a little gentler. I just felt some sort of relief that I hadn't felt in months and months and months. By Saturday, I was feeling well enough to hike in the gorge with my best friend. I came back and saw Mary on Sunday and she said, you know, I think you, re you received an infusion of life. That was a God meeting. There was some sort of spiritual consciousness working through the group that entered into you and is helping you. Within 30 days, I would say that half my symptoms were gone. Within 90 days, I was completely free of symptoms. Now, my psychiatrist later said, well, you would have gotten better anyway, but no, that, that, that couldn't have happened because people were trying everything they could for nine months and nothing was helping. So I choose to believe that some, something went on, which I still can't explain and describe, but it made a huge difference in my life. So, what is the moral of the story? Well, we have a lot of technology, we have a lot of drugs, we have a lot of new discoveries for helping people with mental illnesses, but there still is no power greater than the human power of love and connection. Dean Ornish wrote a book called Love and Survival in which he details how strong community and, and, and connection can help people survive heart disease and other types of chronic physical illnesses in a way that even medicine and drugs cannot help. And what's true about these physical illnesses is also true of mental illnesses as I've discovered. That these individuals who care enough about me to come together and you could say pray over me or affirm my well-being were the critical difference uh, between life and death. I'd like to conclude my journey uh, by sharing with you uh, a few words uh, that I wrote in my book, Healing from Depression. What goes down must come up. There can be no death without rebirth. Every ending is followed by a beginning, and the experience of hell is nothing but a precursor to the glory of heaven. In other words, I tell people that, you know, if you're going down into depression, you will rise again. That's just the way that nature operates. Day follows night, spring follows winter. And these are not intellectual supposition, these words. I went through this. I went through the crucifixion and the resurrection. So I know this is real, and I've seen people in the groups I've led. I've seen people write to me after reading my book. This is not just my story. This is our story. And I do have this final message to share with you that really describes this death and rebirth experience. If you are on the edge of the abyss, don't jump. If you are going through hell, don't stop. As long as you are breathing, there is hope. As long as day follows night, there is hope. Nothing stays the same forever. Set the intention to heal. And by that I mean, just ask spirit or your higher power to help you out that you want to get well. Reach out for support to other people, to spirit, to your higher power, whatever you call it. And ask for support in staying with this pain and hanging in there and persisting until it repatterns, because it will. Because the only constant in the universe is change. However you bad you feel today, things will change at some point. They have to. It's a physical law of the universe. So, set the intention to heal, reach out for support, and you will find help. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my story. And remember what they say in AA. Don't give up five minutes before the miracle. Thank you.